so it's our responsibility to sacrifice in order to see a world that is better than it is and shows are a world unto themselves that are better than what the real world is. This is Champagne is also a band podcast. One songwriter, one song. I'm Sven, your host for a journey into the music of Champagne Urbana. Recorded in the Blue Box studio with a songwriter from the Champagne Urbana music scene, past or present. Champagne is also a band podcast is proud to be a part of the Champagne Showers podcast network. Welcome to Champagne is also a band podcast. Today I have Luke Burketter, and you may know Luke from such bands as Yarn, The Fratics, Violet Skies, Fireflies, Exhale, Look Down, Mitten, Take Care, Anna Karina, which was a solo project, and then Anna Karina and, uh, sorry, Anna Karenina. I'm Anna sorry. Karina, what did I say? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just, I'm just sorry that these band names are <laughs> confusing. <laughs> um, so, uh, Withershins, Marathon, Bookmobile, and as a touring member of Birthmark, also Staghorn and Knave. He also did a solo project at, under the name Luke R. Burketter. And his most current project is Overachiever. So, Luke, welcome to the show. Hey, man. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. And I, I'm I very... try not. I try not to like jump right into my NPR voice. So I have to like you have to shake off the studio. Uh, well, I'm talking about myself. I have to shake off my <laughs> studio voice. I do this on my podcast too, where I just immediately be like, "Welcome mm-hmm. to every movie, Mary." You know, like yes, uh, I understand. Because this is a very chill space. Thanks thanks for having me. Your place is great. The studio oh, is cool. Today we're going to be listening to your song, Heads Up, um, off of your recent release of Volume 1, Man Bat, that is with your current project, Overachiever. So, without further ado, let's listen to the song. Right on.
Welcome back. Luke, of course, my first and favorite question to always ask is, what came first, the music or the words? Oh, man. They were written mostly in tandem. So this project is specifically, it's a home project. It's a basement project, mostly. Like, this was all recorded in my basement on a four-track task cam. Hmm. And I only released it on tape. It only in this song I used all four tracks. And most of the songs I didn't even do that. The lyrics, I think it, it was something I woke up and I wrote some of it. There's four things I like to do every day in order to be a happy, healthy, mentally healthy person. And I don't do them every day, but the days I do them are my favorite days. Mm. You know, it's. I, I, I would say, this is a little tangential, but we're just going to follow me here. <laughs> mm-hmm. I wake up, I like to drink coffee and have a solid uninterrupted reading session, mm-hmm. uh, you know, just for fun, whatever. Right. I, I, I usually have a general goal and like a page count. If it's a novel that isn't too dense, I want to get through about. 50 pages or where whatever it's a section a part something that's a nice stopping point yeah usually about an hour and a half time cut out and the second thing i do is some like basic exercise so like i have a stationary bike uh, sit-ups push-ups just just get it the fuck out of the way because it makes you feel better but i hate to do i hate it (laughs) (laughs) and then i usually go to writing at that point and i i want to cut out some time for elective writing i i like writing i'm working on a book once again i want to say i do not follow this on a daily basis because this is a lot of free time is kind of need needed and also a lot of discipline to which i do not have the discipline part and then I work on music. A lot of this project, the individual tracks, I did in that method. I would write the lyrics and I would write the music day of and then record it that day or record part of it and come back to it. But this song in particular, I did entirely day of. Mm. So it was like a piece of inspiration. I wrote something, some lyrics. And then I started working on the music. And then when I attract all four tracks of this, like building it from that drum beat, I started with the drums on this track and then started layering like the vibraphone and the synths. And then when it came to the vocals, I had some of the the vibe, the ideas, Mm -hmm. and then I improvised a lot of the vocals. So... Uh, there the core stuff like heads up keep your head like all yeah. that stuff and then it was a lot of like a list of things i kind of wanted to throw in there but uh-huh. like the phraseology and then there's like some vamping it's kind of stunted because like i i only did it i only did the vocal part a couple times and it's just me with a megaphone in my basement oh okay scream <laughs> like screaming random phrases mm-hmm. through into a megaphone i shouldn't say random but it had a, a vibe to it yeah and it was just like positive affirmations for most of it there's like a breakdown it's like give your cat a treat do the things that you know make you happy and acknowledge that those are the things that make you like a a better person. For, of course, our listeners, I rolled my eyes slightly and then crossed out the word glockenspiel and then wrote in vibraphone. Because uh-huh. I, I just, I, because I was like, oh, I gotta mention that. But then I, I was like, oh, of course that's a vibraphone. Anyway, um, yeah. so, so, well, that brought- that's a that's a fine confusion to have though. Like only like percussionists that work in mallet percussions in general, they're the only people that have a good handle on the variations. And I'm gonna make it even more confusing. Technically, what I'm playing is called a vibra harp. It's confusing because it's not an instrument that is very common at all. In fact, my vibra harp was built in the 1930s in <laughs> Chicago by the Deegan Percussion Corporation. Oh. What's interesting is that it is a small vibraphone. That's all you really need to know. Okay. It was the first attempt at a portable vibraphone. Vibraphones are a relatively modern instrument in that they're only like 
110 years old. You know, it was like a a 20th century instrument. And in the 30s there, like jazz drummers really wanted to tour with vibraphones and get them gig to gig. And so they made these like two and a half octave vibraphones that were built into a wooden box. Instead of having the Uh, resonators on the bottom of the vibraphone, they, they just use all the sound like the spinning discs, they give it the vibrato, shoots all the sound upwards. So it could be mic'd, uh. and then they could set up their drum sets or trap sets at the time, and then have a vibraphone at an angle next to their drum set so they can set their six down, grab some mallets, and play off to the side of their drum set. That vibra harp is original from that time period huh. that it had refurbished. And it's, it, I mean, it's more than an antique. It's, you know, right, practically right. ancient. It's a rarity. Um, <laughs> your overachiever projects, like, mm-hmm. there's a few moments in this song where you bring in what I would call a, like a, a kind of a Leslie organ kind of sound. Um, uh-huh. And then you've also got, I mean, it's you're just holding one chord. It sounds like you're just doing like a, a bar chord. This project is ve- very much a quarantine project. In that I was like, well, I have all of this half used, half broken equipment in my basement from it's my wife and I's house. We, we've lived there for since 2008 and all of my bands for a very long time had band practice there before we upgraded to kind of like studio spaces and stuff like that. And I had all of these Casio keyboards that were like half, I mean, truly like broken like the casio i ended up using had keys missing that the electrics were really spotty like i'm playing that part in trying to hold the jack in (laughs) uh and and my wife had an old vox amp like a just a solid state amp and i dimed it out and then put it had all these weird presets on it that are just kind of like just kind of generic presets of like delay, echo, distortion, shit like that. And I found the gnarliest sounding yeah. presets, dimed everything out. I mean, just really abused the amp and then mic'd it really close. When you say dimed everything out, yeah. what what do you mean by that? Oh, I, I turned everything up as loud as possible. Oh, oh I, I, got I, it. I, I turned it up to I, 10. I turned it up to got 10. Got it. And no, no Spinal Tap references here. Um, okay. <laughs> no, not allowed. I'm not there yet, but I'm fighting middle-aged man references. Anything that I consider like a joke that I, I love him, but that my old man would make, I, I'm avoiding. Gotcha. You know, I'm avoiding all references to the Caddyshack and this is Spinal <laughs> Tap. And anyways, so I, I, I dimed everything out and turned it all to 10 and got the grossest just one of the grossest tones Mm. and then that casio if you remember old small sort of portable casios usually have a chord setting so like on the left hand side of the keyboard it's like you you got all your major uh, chords and then you can hit one key and it goes Mm. so that's c and that was my guitar sound that, gotcha that, okay yeah okay it's a key it's obviously keyboard and other tracks i made it sound more like a guitar by like messing with it even more and uh-huh. it, in its application like there's some there's like a track on here that's really heavy that's like where i literally do like grind vo- uh-huh. vocals and stuff and that was my electric guitar was that same casio gotcha. keyboard yeah i see okay so when did you bring in the uh the vibra harp like, like, where does that melody come from? I built songs based on, like, the primary interest first. So I, I didn't necessarily build songs with drums first. Sometimes I build it with just piano. Mm-hmm. Like, I have a piano in my living room, and, I, and it's just piano and some, like, found sounds. Um, there's one song that the percussion is all me walking in the park in mm-hmm. the fall, like the leaves crunching in rhythm, and then yeah. I built a song around that. So I built it around the drums and it was based off of, I'm going to answer your question soon. Uh. (laughs) Uh, It was, it was based off of this viral video of a Indian percussionist 
Luke wanted me to clarify that the person is actually Turkish, not Indian. So check the show notes for the link. Doing like hand drum percussion in the park and singing. It, 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 it's that. Right. Got it. I fell in love with that drum beat and then I learned how to play a variation of that. And it's like when we were listening to it, it was like, oh, this is my attempt at a dance song. When I finished it, I played it for my wife and we danced in the living room to it. I meant it to be a very celebratory, dancey, bouncy, poppy song. I mean, it's about the, about as close as I am, am capable of getting at like a pop song. I know. Yeah, I can't sing for shit and like, I, you know, but it is meant to be like a very uncharacteristic for me, a happy, fun, poppy thing. Mm. Do you think of yourself as kind of a dark, sinister fella? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I How I think of myself is, <laughs> it's like the perfect question. <laughs> I don't think so. I, I mean, honestly, I'm attracted... I, as kind of a depressive person, I have I have those sides of myself and like the writing, I, I tend to gravitate towards dark humor, dark comedy. I think this record is very funny, but I don't know if other people are going to think it's funny. I also think some of the tracks deal with some like losses I've had in the last like year that were like r really rough and and it has to do with me dealing with the fact that I'm also going to die when I you know hopefully when I'm older but the song I wrote that had to do with those losses seems very funny okay it, yeah because I was gonna <laughs> say I don't remember anything that seemed very morose or I mean it's all very there's a high energy to most of it and and like yeah. a, it's it, it's not taking yourself very seriously, but I think some of these, it's like the, the refrain of course that I, I keep thinking about is like you, you saying for, for fuck's sake, be kind, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, that's, that's so we intrinsically know to fucking be kind, but right. I, I feel like even more so during these times, the pandemic, you know, Black Lives Matter, and yeah, it's one of those things where it's like uh, somebody didn't get the memo, even though we're somehow supposed to be wired this way to to be know to be kind to support the entire human race kind of idea. I don't know, right? But but I I think that that's like the this this feels like the perfect thing to be saying over and over and almost even in a mantra like way to remember to be kind anyway right. that was my rambling kind of like no no no, no. The, the you, part that you, I really you appreciate you tapped on you tapped into something that i i've been grappling with i think it, to to tell someone to be kind seems super simplistic but in practice it's actually very difficult so like i mean what do we, what we consider kindness it, it is listening to people and a big part of what you're saying with like Black Lives Matter, hate crimes, and then like um, uh, feminism and like what the women in your life need from you. I, I, I like a big part of my personal growth, if we want to talk about growth, is figuring out how to communicate in a more kind way. I think the biggest criticism my wife has of me is that I am unkind with my opinions. I, yeah. I am oftentimes rough and, and it doesn't take into account. See, it, it comes from a background of like me and my dad getting into arguments about stuff for fun. Uh, right. Yeah. I can't, I come from a long background of hyper opinionated men who will just have like loud boisterous conversations about stuff that we care about that's either very important or not at all important mm. and a lot of times it's for fun it's how we communicate but like a big part of my personal growth and something i am still not good at is assessing the women in my life and the people in my life that had their voices suppressed. A big kindness is to shut the fuck up and listen to people 
And it's something that I struggle with because I want to talk and I get excited and I get like rambly like I'm doing right now. (laughs) And I will interrupt you in this interview too many times. It is going to happen, but it's something that I'm trying to be more conscientious of. And in turn, that is kindness. You know, it's a simple concept, but it's very hard to execute. Do you have a particular favorite part in this song? The favorite part that I'm getting fun emails and messages to about is the call your mom part. I forget to call her sometimes. It's literally a note to myself that you need to call and see what she's up to and talk to her about her day more often because I don't, we, we haven't lived in the same town and since I was 17 years old, I'm 37 now. It's just a reminder. And for those of you that have moms and their, and have a good relationship with them or, or a non-abusive relationship, I should say, give your mom a call. She wants to hear from you. It's like, it's just a nice reminder because it's, it sometimes is a little bit of a chore and that's okay. I've never regretted calling my mom. Talking on the phone seems a little antiquated now having a long conversation on the phone. My favorite part, I think, is the stuff that is a note directly to myself, which is relax. You've done a lot. You've done enough. Get up, do more because it makes you happy, but also relax. You've done it. And the name of the project is Overachiever because it's kind of a wink. It's Mm -hmm. like, it's funny, but it's also, I'm always beating myself up for not doing enough. I wake up and I get depressed and I feel like shit because like I haven't released volume two yet. Yeah. And that sits on my chest like, oh, I meant to, I was wanted to do this like almost like every two months I wanted a new volume out. My wife is oftentimes like, you've done a lot. You just released a solo record and it was like your first full-length solo record where you did everything and all that stuff the second i release it i'm like what's next i never stop mm. to be like oh you've you've done it you you're good like i, I might right. i felt my chest tightening up just saying that because i have all these other projects in the works and i need to get to it uh, and the days that i spend just like watching movies and smoking weed and stuff like i'm like oh those are necessary things for people you need to eat a snack relax give your cat a treat like all of that is Mm -hmm. based on the fact that uh, like stop (laughs) you know who's it for anyways it's for you be kinder to yourself too since i did everything and i did it very improvisationally you know i built things and i didn't discard any bad ideas basically Mm. like i just ran with whatever seemed to be working right and then once i committed to it i did it and i released the tape all the tracks are in order of how i wrote them and where mm. and i learned how to record on this task cam i'm not an engineer at all I, I just learned as i went and it and it was to just have a total expression and what turned out and i recommend it to anyone is something that it's probably the most representative of me as a person that i've ever made it's oh. it's un it's almost like some of it is like unchecked id like it's like just blah you know like let's fucking do it like in this song just yell about the things that i think are important Mm -hmm. or what comes to mind i mean i really love improv comedy and like ucb upright citizens brigade their motto is don't think that's funny but it's also an extremely hard thing to do i'm always in my head so if you're like fuck it don't think about it it becomes extremely honest and kind of immature and like great i'm not i'm not a keyboardist for anything but one of the things that i have often i want to call it a flying dream because it has that same kind of nature right where it's like you have a dream where you can fly and you can control and it's all about feeling like liberated and free and you know one of the dreams that i always have is like of writing music or playing improvisationally to me i call it just like punching punching the keyboard and it's always me like sitting in front of a piano and just doing my hands the way that they need to do and i hear that that melody that's coming out from it and it feels it feels really good because it's like i'm not thinking about it i'm just listening to the music and and reacting to the music and and that's what's coming out i'm not thinking about it my brain's just generating these things and who knows if it's 
actually someone else's song that I'm just imagining, but because, you know, sometimes just that happy accident or even just letting that thing go is so important to like the creative process. You spend a whole lot of time as a musician learning how to do it, right? You'll mm -hmm. learn the techniques, you learn it, either trained or other on your own, you're reading books about it. And, you know, a lot of what I learned was just from listening and absorbing. So you absorb all the stuff, you try to do it in a unique way. There's no wrong way to approach it. And like, there's plenty of bands have been in and projects that it's like, we wrote a thesis. Mm. Like this is the, this is the thesis for this song or for this album even, or double album, you know, and like, like take care is this extremely hmm. methodical i mean we jam and we have fun and we and then we bring things out like that but we also the way i've always approached take care is conceptual these are the things that i want to hear and i don't know how to get those things but it starts with the concept and then you build from there there's a point where if you want to do it this way like you train how to play things the quote unquote right way or whatever and and how to build a song it's like oh you do this 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 and this or you stop and you just free it you free you have all the skill sets and, and that's the thing like a lot of great noise musicians a lot of great improv musicians learned how to do it the standard way and then they disconnected, they deconstructed, they separated their logical brain from their just impulses. And so they have the skill. And then if you stop thinking about it, you tap into something that isn't like more real, but it taps into something more honest. I come from like a very almost mathy technical musical background, but then also it was in like marathon, which was the exact opposite of that. It was a lot of it right. was improvised. And we played shows where we hadn't, where there's 14 people on stage. And for some of that set, we had no idea what we were going to do. COVID-19 got you down. You looking for some music, some video games. Well, Exile Main Street still has all the things you need. New and used LPs, CDs, and video games. Exile Main Street still has something for any music enthusiast and old-school gaming devotee. Exile Main Street is taking orders, making deliveries, and pickups by appointment. They can find just about any music or video game you need. Check out their website, ExileMainStreet.com, for links to their Discogs page for new additions. You can also contact them via Facebook Messenger to see what they can find for you. They can also be reached on Instagram, Twitter, email, or phone at 217-398-MAIN. That's 217-398-6246. Welcome back. Luke, so do you have a favorite venue in Champaign-Urbana? Well, uh, I think... Uh, I. Oh, man. And not to get... I mean, we have to acknowledge the elephant in the room of all of the venues that have closed. Right. In the lab. Yep. And this wasn't even due to the quarantine. This was just fucking closures. Just right. people that don't want to do it anymore. Right. And I say that because we have to acknowledge that my favorite venue of all time was Mike and Molly's. That, that's where I grew up. That's where I yeah. grew up as a musician. I played... This is not an exaggeration. Hundreds of shows there. To answer the favorite venue thing, I talked uh -huh. negatively about the things that we've lost. So we lost the okay. Chord slash High Dive. We lost Mike and Molly's to a lesser degree, but it was a stage. We lost Cowboy Monkey. But we got the fucking Rose Bowl. And the Rose Bowl is a beacon of light for what's to come in Champaign-Urbana. Just great, hardworking, touring musicians, and they're building a venue right now. Like, literally, like this, have you seen any of the work on the stage? I've seen some of it. I appreciated the, the Rose Bowl before, yes. but I, I feel like it was, it was a good time for people to take over and kind of revitalize it and, and have that new passion. In the Rose Bowl for a long time, most of the programming was country cover. 
and there's so much to come like they and they broke out of the mold there's been weird shows like Karthik's noise shows at the Rose Bowl. Oh. I miss that show, but I just listened to the episode that you recorded with Karthik, the two-parter, and was so, I like, I don't know, I think I was playing shows or out of town, you know, the, yeah. the problem with being a working musician that wants to go where audiences are, right. is that you have to tour in order to find an audience, especially if you're doing really esoteric shit like right. that I've tended to do i miss cool stuff that happens in town yeah because i'm either showed out or i'm playing one i feel bad that they took it over just as the pandemic was it felt like Mm -hmm. they just started getting it going and then all of a sudden the pandemic but man did they pivot so well and they have managed to make it work um that i i the ingenuity anyway i this is this is um hi thank you for tuning into the rose bowl love uh, let's give program. rose bowl all of the fucking <laughs> love all of the love to rose bowl because like i'm especially endeared to them because of because of the show i just saw there charlie gave me a big hug and was like hey, it was great to see your face you know and i like almost cried i'm my stoicism has been broken down by a uh, global pandemic and just f- the general political fuckery of the modern age you yeah. know not that that fuckery hasn't always existed. I was an active booker at Mike and Molly's back in the day, and I, and I wanted to be an active booker again. But name a venue I can be an active booker in. Exactly. And I'm not um, going to... My basement sucks, so I'm not going to do that. Right. My yeah. wife would kill me. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's a, she's a supporter of the arts. I shouldn't... But we're not going to have shows in my basement. No. No, I can I've, totally I've lived that. that life. I'd put in my dues. The Green Street House in Urbana for years and years. The Fireflies House. Mm. We booked shows for fucking awesome bands for a long time. I did the house show thing. It's up to, it's the 20 somethings that do that. I'm not doing that shit. Are there any particular shows that were your favorite in terms of the Champagne Urbana music scene that you performed at? One at Craner. I mean, it was Pygmalion. I think it was 06. I have a poster. I have a print from it in my bathroom. So that's why I know nice. this detail. Marathon played in that room. Uh, Thundercat. Whatever that room is. Yeah. Which was oh the God. one of the greatest shows I've ever played ever. That is a real runner up for one of the greatest shows I've ever played. God, was Thundercat opening for so Thundercat amazing. with the full Marathon Guitar Orchestra. In the best sounding room for that, for music, for any kind of music, but specifically for like a band that was really obsessed with timbre, with dynamic, with like the tone of things versus the song, you know, it was more about like sonically, what is this? And if you're in a perfect room that was made for like orchestral stuff or to reflect exactly what you're trying to do back at you and like the band can hear it as it's happening, playing that show was like one of the pinnacles of representing the music that we heard in our head but never got to hear. If you're playing a basement or like a weird club or whatever, you oftentimes don't hear what's actually happening. It's amplified out, but you don't get it reflected back. In that show, it was like Matt Yates was on one drum set across the stage. I was on one drum set. Everyone was in between us. The monitor system was amazing. The visuals were incredible. And then we could really hear everything we're doing. Karthik was first row. I keep shouting out Karthik because, God damn it, I love that man. You've been around and you have performed in several bands in the Champaign-Urbana area. You know, with that breadth of experience, what do you think makes a good music scene? What can we do to make a music scene better? What what makes a good music scene, I would say, is enabling, which I know is a funny term for, you know, it's right. usually uh, has a negative connotation, but it also is a very real thing. We need to promote each other's stuff. And then also there needs to be someone that has a venue that has the resources and shares those resources. It needs to be art first and profit second. I 
absolutely understand as a promoter, as a person that's played shows, I understand that money changes hands and it, there is not a lot to go around, but I also understand that you got to support people that are making artistic decisions that promote culture that are moving the cultural dial forward that can come off as pretentious and and i'm not going to decide what moves that dial forward as an enabler as a person that promotes shows i am going to promote the things that i like or things that are underrepresented or marginalized it's up to the enablers to set up the show and actually show up on time and run the sound, you know, do the work. The the work has to be done in order to enable for a good show. And it has to be safe. So there has to be a sober staff person there that is making sure that everything is cool, you know, that like people feel comfortable and you have to reach out to the people that normally don't feel comfortable and allow a safe space for them to see a basement show, which is predominantly big white dudes. I forget what basement show we played in town. But I was so proud of Jared and Bookmobile. He shut down a dancing, moshing, slam dance is a very old term. (laughs) Just like a a rowdy thing because he saw that there is a bunch of people on the extremities. You know, we're a fast, rowdy punk band, but also like fucking be aware of your space. Be aware of the fact that you're like this six foot, 200 pound dude that is standing up front and shoving your buds and like spraying beer on everyone. We got to do better than that. That's the main thing about the independent scene. We have to do better than what is cool with able-bodied, bigger men. Like we got to do better to make sure that everyone that doesn't fit that description feels safe at an underground show. There's the illusion of safety in club shows. I don't actually believe them to be safe. There is actually the ability to call a bouncer or a staff person, potentially. If it's a well-run club show, great. Most I've played, not the case. They're almost as unruly as a basement show touring all over the world the house shows tend to be in my opinion like well-run house shows are leagues and above greater than like your basic club show and i also feel like people that go to house shows are there because they want to see the music not because they want to drink and see their friends and yeah i mean there's some of that too in the house shows but i i, I mean there's the there's party house shows undercurrent, and that's a little different but. yeah like the undercurrent of we want to see these bands Rather than I'm at the club and these bands are here. Or you're at your favorite bar and there's bands and you're like, talk over the quiet stuff, which drives me fucking completely apeshit because some of my favorite bands are extremely quiet. But one of my all time favorite bands is low and seeing low in a bad audience is the worst shit. Cause that has got to suck. Yes. It's got to suck. Uh, gratefully. The couple times I played Pygmalion were really great shows. One of those early interactions with Garth Lake, we were, bu- were buds, but I think before before we truly, we just always talked at shows. And it was like, he was always at the shows I was at. And I was like, hey, Garth Lake, you know, you don't have to go to every show. Like, you don't have to do it. it I felt like there was like someone that had like a gun to his head. And it's like, you go to every local show. <laughs> Yes. But in reality, uh, he's just like the best enabler. Go, yes. Swinging back to what I was saying before. He's just like pure support. Yeah. And a, a great musician uh, who and a great performer who also is an enabler. One of my best friends, Isaac Arms, be, before we are in a band together, was one of the greatest enablers in the scene. The, a great example of what you need for a flourishing scene are, are people like Isaac Arms, who, you know, he sacrificed his living space. They, he, yes, you're right. Thank I, you so I much. Just because I, I know you would feel I know. terrible later. I know. It, I Yes. And, and the trouble with pronouns is especially if you knew a person for a solid decade before that change. They 
sacrifice their space. They sacrifice all their free time. Truly, I saw them work tirelessly to book shows and Mike Molly's to promote bands. And it was all about love. Yeah. The, the dough was a second thought. Right. Unfortunately, there's a, there's a truth. There's a shittiness to our system that we don't put art first. So it's our responsibility to sacrifice in order to see a world that is better than it is. And shows right. are a world unto themselves that are better than what the real world is. Mm. We, we escape. We go to someone's living room. We go to their basement. We go to a club, a bar, to, if you're into drinking, to drink uh, if you smoke weed in the alley and you go in and you see, or you're to totally sober, that's fine. I don't need to focus on that. Um, I'm just, just speaking from personal experience. If you smoke weed in the alley behind the brass rail and go in and see your favorite local band or alongside a really rad touring band, you've experienced a world that doesn't exist. You've experienced art in an immersive way that we don't get in our daily lives unless you work towards that goal, which I don't, I don't know too many promoters that don't work towards that goal. But in the reality of it is that it's a brief respite from your day job or the grind. Even in the midst of the current coronavirus pandemic, the Jubilee Cafe is continuing to serve packaged, home-cooked meals free to all every Monday evening, 5 to 6.30 p.m. Meals are available for pickup outside the 6th Street door to the Community United Church of Christ in Champaign, Illinois, 805 South 6th Street. Jubilee Cafe's mission remains the same. Feed hungry people by cooking healthy and delicious meals. We are open to anyone who cares to receive a meal. For information on the meal or how to volunteer, go to the Jubilee Cafe CUCC Facebook page or email us at jubilee.cafe at community-ucc.org. Welcome back. So... Luke, what is your favorite non-musical thing? Uh, to clarify the question, I, I got to clarify. Are we saying like experiences, objects besides um, family? I mean, because it can be anything. Because my favorite thing in the world is my wife, Joanna Troutman Burkhutter. Like I'm obsessively in love with Joanna Troutman. Perfect. So... I need to first and foremost, but I, but I think the nature of the question is something m no. more or no, I mean, something it, different. It, no, I mean, it works because, you know, this is just, I mean, I've, I've had a variety of like, I've had video games. I've had sure. the concept of whimsy. I've had okay I mean, the concept so, I mean, of whimsy. So yeah, that was that okay. was actually that was uh, uh, Clockwork Al, also known as Dawn Patrol, episode oh, twenty nine. Oh, Anka. Yeah, Anka. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Her her favorite thing was whimsy and also satire. It's sentimental, and sometimes people shy away from sentimentality. Mm. But but we've been a, a couple for it's now like thirteen years. She's my person, so. I have to acknowledge that. I think as like passionate hobbies go, the non music things go. Yeah. I'm I have to say movies. Okay. I am a man obsessed with movies, and I should specifically say I'm obsessed with all movies. But I have a archival knowledge of B movies, genre movies, mm -hmm. grind it, it, like exploitation, grindhouse, horror, sci fi. Mm -hmm. But like to a level, when I tell people I like movies, they're like, oh yeah, cool, what do you want? So I collect VHS tapes also. I think the last time we were archiving them, my wife and I are archiving them. I, I'm the buyer and she helps me with the archivalness. And we're actually going to set up a library of okay. like B-movies, genre stuff, things that people can come over and rent from us. 
for That's like cool. a club fee or something like this. We're actually dedicating our one spare room, which has been her office for the last year, but she moved back into the office to tapes specifically like, you know, like an uh, old school okay. 80s video rental store yeah. that we kind of grew up with through the 90s. We have over 1400 tapes right now. Okay. Uh, and I keep buying it, it, I like curated stuff. I'm obsessed with finding those movies that never made it to the digital sphere that were uh, only on tape yeah. that like n hardly anyone has seen, or if they've seen it, they rented it once in the eighties and returned it to their Hollywood or blockbuster or mom and pop store. Since quarantine, since last August, I have a letterbox account. Are you familiar with the social media yeah, yeah. site letterbox? Yep. And I've been keeping a diary of every movie I've watched since August and writing a sometimes short, sometimes rambly ass long review of each movie I've seen since yeah. August. And I'm up to 380 titles. If that gives you any indication of like how much time I dedicate to movie watching, that would be, okay. if you do a little bit of math there, it hasn't yeah. been a year yet. So... Yeah. I'm averaging about 1.3 or 1.5 movies a day. Since you mentioned B-movies or even lesser known, non-digitized movies that didn't make it into that realm, do you have a favorite one that would fit into that category? Is there there's something that maybe you would be like, you know what, everybody needs to see this? I, I mean, there's probably not an everybody needs to see this because I think that's it's too, all It's too super niche. niche. Yeah. It's like you got a, a but the problem with a bunch of stuff from the 80s is that it's from the fucking 80s. So it's like when I say exploitation, yeah. I truly mean like they're exploitative or like action movies with really dubious stuff or horror yeah. movies that we, any fan of horror movies historically and now right. understand that they push the limitations of good taste of like boundaries. They, yeah. So they all come with some degree of a caveat and staring at the sun of some of those movies is part of the appeal. And I will confess to to feeling like seeing something and it's like, oh, fuck, I don't I don't want to actually see that. And then there's just the stuff that is like totally joyful and totally great mm. and actually or like hidden gems that you can play for most people and you don't need all of these asterisks next to. So what's one movie that you, you saw and you're like, damn, that really fucked me up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really fucked me up? If we're going to go along that line where it's just like, oh, God, I shouldn't have seen. The example uh, I've used in the past, I, I would say this this is more popular, but still pretty underground. You have to be horror fans would be like, yeah, of course I've seen that. But like for Normie's Last House on the Left, oh. are you familiar with the early Wes Craven's yeah. Sean S. Cunningham kind of student film that they made I, together I, there's deeper cuts than that okay. and i can already hear sort of the gatekeeper horror fans being like ah uh, come on dude but when i saw that as a teenager i watched that and i was like my immediate reaction was like that was incredible but also i wish i hadn't seen that movie i think like another one would be like cannibal holocaust i would say that those are extremely hard movies to watch there's big asterisks next to all of them as fun great b movies go uh -huh. we can switch to that uh-huh i think everyone should see everyone if you like exploitative action movies i think people should watch action usa it's a movie from i want to say like 1987 and 1987 has to be one of the greatest years for b movies because it was oh. the the vhs boom was in full effect at that time uh, so were and, these like direct to direct to vhs or were they were they literally like b movies like the b movie to a they yeah, the, the, the not literally the B movie, though they probably played in a drive-in and probably was oh. the late movie, the B movie, or like Grand House Theaters in New York or something. Action USA was definitely a movie that was based less on like the seventies term B movie gotcha. and more on the the straight the video market distribution made it possible for you to make a semi competent movie and get it distributed in every blockbuster or mom and pop video store in America. 
So mm-hmm. like if it only got a theatrical run in like one theater in LA, it didn't it didn't matter because you're going to make your money on the distribution. Really? And okay. when VHS became cheaper and cheaper, it started off at VHS tapes were really expensive. I'll buy tapes from the early 80s that have a price tag that say like eighty nine ninety nine on them. I, I kind of remember And I'm getting that. them for like a quarter, you know? Yeah. But they, they figured out the pricing. They figured out how to manufacture them cheaper. And so what happened is that they could distribute them to all of these. It, like every, all the mom tops, every fucking town had them. I had one in my neighborhood that we would walk to and rent movies from just like a single room, kind of like this room mm-hmm. is just wall to wall tapes or like a gas station. You can rent yeah. tapes at a gas station or a bodega or something. But when that opened up all of these movies, I cannot promote action USA enough. Like stunt, uh, it was uh, directed by a stunt man. The lead is Greg Cummings, who plays Max Dad. Max Dad, yeah, the like psychopathic <laughs> Max Dad, who was a B, like he had a long career as playing like villains, mm. sort of B movie. He was in an early movie called Hackoween. <laughs> no, not Hackoween. That's a different movie. Um, he he like did a a really insane horror movie from the early eighties. Hack Lantern, I think, is the name of that movie. <laughs> I, I'm I'm yeah, almost yeah. positive it's yeah. Hack Lantern. There's a Halloween that's a different movie. I think this is Hack Lantern. Anyways, I have a brain full of this shit because I'm completely obsessed with it. I find movies t- like it. It's a way for me to escape from the kind of uh, my serious thoughts on music as a music maker and producer. Like, there's a huge part of movies that are music. I, I like the just kind of the expression of it, but some sometimes the kind of mental release. If you sit down and you watch Action USA, which I highly recommend you do, <laughs> you are in for a treat. It was directed by a stunt man. He got all of his stunt buddies and were like, "Hey, what are you best at? Oh, you you can hang out of a helicopter by your feet." Great. Let's put it in the movie. Oh, Oh, you're good at fire stunts. Your car's going to explode and you're going to be on fire and you're going to run around in a drainage ditch for a while. (laughs) And we're going to film that. And that's what that movie is. Like, are you good at car stunts? Great. We're going to put you in a wig and you're going to drive through a house and that house is going to (laughs) explode once you drive (laughs) through it. Literally things that happen in that movie and it's so self-aware and it's just like a stunt reel for all these actors but it's making a legitimate movie and it's gonna be distributed and you're gonna rent it on accident probably if you're 13 years old you're probably gonna think it's the greatest movie ever made Uh, or if you're a stunted a 37 year old adult like myself you're gonna think it's the greatest movie ever made (laughs) Luke, thank you so much for being on the show. And yeah, man. Telling me about your song, Heads Up, sharing a, uh, a, a Coors Light. We split it. and uh, <laughs> <laughs> We'll split it. <laughs> and uh, some, uh, some cool ranch Doritos. I just appreciate your knowledge of the Champaign-Urbana music scene and like what we can do to make things better and telling me all about your favorite non-musical thing and it's yeah. it's just been it's been a pleasure so thank you so much for being on the show hey man th- thanks finn hey it's a real treat to be here in person with you i absolutely think that ran about enablers and stuff like that you are an enabler oh thank you you are the person that is propping up all this great local music and mm. and getting down to kind of the heart of it And I I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Champagne is also a band podcast. This is Luke Burkheader reminding you great music is out there. Go find it where you live.
I, I like cheap American light beer. It's it's a thing. Yay. That's a wrap. You almost have an NPR voice. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> On the inside. I've never regretted calling my mom.